Hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 322, featuring the first in a new interview series with Mr. Stitch of Stygian Software, the designer of that Underrail game I covered in the previous episode. Now, as you know, if you watched that episode, I'm really a big fan of this game. I think it's great, and I was really excited to get to sit down and talk to the developer, who turns out to be a Serbian uh, with a really interesting take on the genre, which I think you'll really appreciate. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Stidge. All right, folks, I am here with the developer of a game called Underrail, which I hope you've heard of by now since I did a review of it last uh, episode. Uh, his name is Dayan. Uh, we're just talking about the <laughs> pronunciation is going to be hard for me, uh, so I'll just let you say the say your name, Dayan. Uh, Dayan Radišić. Right, so you can see the trouble there. <laughs> anyway, we'll just I'll just be calling him by his uh, nickname, Stitch here. Uh, so, Stitch, could you tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, how you got into this business and where you learned to code and program and all these things? Uh, well, I learned to code uh, mostly on my own. I was uh, first time I saw uh, programming was uh, in a basic language, in QBasic for MS-DOS, and I instantly got interested in what is going on, how the, it works, so I started, you know, programming myself and I'm mostly self-taught as a programmer. After basic I went into C++ and then finally C Sharp. And yeah, I remember that Q basic, right? Was that the one with the gorillas? Uh, yeah, the, 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 you mean a sample game? Yeah, a little sample game, I remember. Yeah, that. I remember it, yeah. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was too young to understand uh, how, it, uh, how it functioned, so I just went on my own and tried uh, experimenting on my own to recreate that sort of thing. And uh, later I, uh, I got a job uh, writing uh, banking software. So and then I got into the C-sharp.net and all the, all the Microsoft business stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, and at a certain point it just got uh, kind of boring to do. I was, I was feeling like uh, I was uh, I wasn't doing anything important. I was wasting wasting my uh, my skills. So I started doing a, a project on the side, you know, like, just like a hobby. Yeah. I can see that. I mean, make a role playing game or make banking software. <laughs> you know, role playing well, game, banking. So you know, it's not about making banking software, but it's about making money. You know, oh, <laughs> no, sure. no one cares about banking software. No one is passionate <laughs> about banking software. I mean, well, maybe some people are, but. Uh, there's probably and somebody out there really passionate about it, but yeah, I, my 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 boss was uh, really passionate about it, but I I couldn't understand it. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Uh, so like, I assume you played lots of role playing games too. What what are some of your favorites? Well, I played all the classics, you know, like you know, Baldur's Gate series, Icewind Dale series, Arcane and Fallout. Uh, I played Might and Magic series, the the later ones. Like seven, eight, nine. Mm -hmm. uh, a bit of Ultima when I was a lot younger, but I was uh, a bit too young then to <laughs> to understand all the, the concepts of RPG. And uh, how, how old are you, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, Thirty years old. Okay, so yeah. So you played some of the Ultimas. Yeah, but uh, I I couldn't read English that well back then, and uh, and especially Ultima because it's written that uh, old English, you know, <laughs> and yeah. uh, so so I couldn't get that far uh, into the game. But it was an interesting experience, you know, with the open world and going around, doing all sort of stuff, messing with NPCs. So that that got me interested in that sort of uh, game. So you've always been a, on the computer side of gaming. Yeah, exclusively, I forget to say. Just don't like the consoles or, or what? Is, what uh, is I don't know. I, 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 didn't have, uh, I didn't have any consoles when I was young. So maybe it was just that. I don't know. I don't have anything against the old consoles. They, they were sort of a uh, world of their own. You know, you have a certain ty ty type of game that, uh, that fits the console. And today it's like they, they put everything on the console. It doesn't matter. You know, like, uh, hardcore PC RPG uh, on the console, everything on the console. <laughs> yeah, I think we're kind of on the same wavelength as far as that, as far as that goes. 
Like I, I like I like you know uh, Super Mario and all the stuff, oh, uh, sure, the man. console stuff. Uh, I love it, but to play something like uh, Unreal on a console, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how would that work. I don't know. It's not coming like to the Xbox game. One anytime soon. Huh? <laughs> no. So I think you're the first uh, Serbian developer I've had on. I don't. I was reading uh, on the Wikipedia page about Serbia. It's very interesting history there. I know there's been some <laughs> tragedies and, and that sort of thing. But I'm just wondering, you know, sort of kind of paint a picture for me of what it's like to be a game developer in Serbia. Oh, I don't know. I don't know, know what it's like to be a game developer elsewhere. So I I couldn't compare it, you know. But it's. Uh, I mean, is there an established an... games industry there? Oh, no, no. Well, like there, there's. Uh, there's industry for uh, Hoppa games, you know, hidden object, point and click. We have uh, we have a uh, big company doing that, and we have uh, one big uh, Facebook company. You might have heard of them. It's Nordius. Mm -hmm. They do like uh, like some uh, football management game, and they're really big. But uh, like PC games, not really. Uh, there was like I think one. Uh, game released for the PC in the, in the past that I know of, like okay. a major release. I have a question here from someone named T on Twitter. He says, "Did the war in the Balkans 20 years ago influence you in the development of the game?" <laughs> I read that question. Uh, probably, I don't know. I, don't, I couldn't tell any direct influence it would have, but maybe, maybe I wouldn't be doing this <laughs> if that didn't happen. Maybe I would be living here. Probably I would be living in another city, and who knows? <laughs> I don't know. I was kind of picturing in my my head that uh, Serbia was a sort of war torn place, but according to the Wikipedia page, the economy is actually doing pretty well. Well, that that's a uh, that's a complicated subject right now, but it's not uh, so much of a uh, war zone. I don't know. Some people are thinking like it's. Uh, you know, constantly bombs flying and everything, but it's not like that, not anymore at least. <laughs> and it's uh, it's a good place to uh, to be an uh, IT developer, you know, I mean, programmer in general, because uh, a lot of uh, companies are outsourcing work here because the labor is cheap. Uh, it's cheap for their standards, but it's, uh, you can make a good wage here as a programmer. And uh, generally, there are more uh, more jobs than, than than there are people, you know. So you can get employed easily as a programmer here. So. You also wanted to know if you'd rather write a game in your native language, and what it was like writing so much in the, in a second language. Well, well first a disclaimer: I didn't write so much for this game. I wrote a bit in the beginning, and I kind of set uh, uh, set a framework for the dialogue, I, how it would work, uh, some basic gu guidelines, but uh, most of the writing was done by, by another member that joined later. So he did most of the writing. Is he an English, uh, English native speaker? No, no, no we, we are all Serbians. <laughs> and uh, about uh, writing the game uh, in native language, well, <laughs> yes and no, because uh, uh, it would be easier for me to write in Serbian, of course, and everyone here. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, well, no offense, I know you're an English professor, but I don't find English language particularly uh, pretty. You know, but it's a kind of utilitarian language. I don't know if I said that correctly. It's it's easy to to mash up sentences from it. You you yeah, know, it all comes from German, old German, I think, the origins. Yeah, but even uh, even German language, well, I don't know. They're, they're both easy to, uh, you know, put together. You don't have many, you have a lot of tenses, but uh, the words don't change a lot between them, and you don't have any, I don't even know how it's called in in English. I think it's a case or something, you know. You have like uh, seven cases where the word changes mm -hmm. depending on the case, and it would be like a headache to try to... to like insert a word into a sentence like a uh, player's name or something and not uh, mess that up you know you, you would have to have like uh, five words for uh, pl uh, player's name or something and it would be a pain in the ass to do <laughs> i was uh, really impressed with the the writing i would you know until i looked it up and you know, learned more about the development team i would have just assumed it was some team in america that put the game together i didn't see any you know sort of bad grammar 
bad punctuation. I mean, I play, actually, I think oh, I played uh, plenty of American-made uh, games that had a lot worse, uh, you know, language, English, uh, than, than this game has. That's for sure. Well, we have a lot of uh, problems because we, our language is uh, phonetic. So, you know, we write based on how something sounds. You know, and we will often uh, uh, interchange words in English, like they are, you know, there, and mm -hmm. there, you know, and that, that sort of stuff, because it sounds similar. And when you write at a rapid pace, like we had to, because there's a lot of text in the game, and there's like one guy writing it all, he, he made a lot of, uh, you know, uh, spelling mistakes and that, that sort of stuff. Well, you've got to be curious now. I'd like to hear some of your, your native language. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. What's it sound like? What'd you say? <laughs> there you go. I said it, it's nothing special. It's just, just a language. It's just like uh, most uh, Slavic languages. If you ever heard the Russian, it's a lot of like Russian, but uh, it's not so, uh, not so uh, hard on the accent. Um, and we write in Cyrillic, so <laughs> that's another thing that yeah. people would uh, find hard if we made a game in Cyrillic. I think most of the Western world wouldn't be able to play. That's amazing to me. I mean, this. I mean, the idea if I were trying to make a game like this, and I had to also write it in, you know, for for Serbian <laughs> in a different yeah, language. But, uh, I mean, it must be so hard. I can't even. Well, uh, you know, English is a second language to the entire world. So we know English well, at least uh, to read and uh, write a bit. And so it's it's not the same. Like you would have to learn language from the beginning. And I was learning English from like when I was uh, six year old. You know? it's, it's not that hard. And as, as I said, I mean, English is very easy to learn. It's, it's it's a simple language, at, le at least the basics. I, I guess if you go into literally styles and everything, it has more to it. But uh, just for our uh, needs, uh, I think it's uh, it's pretty easy. Well, that's good. I'm glad that <laughs> that's the case. Uh, so I'm guessing with any game like uh, Under Rail, uh, you probably expect that people are going to compare it to Fallout One and Two. And I, I saw some reviews that were comparing it to Arcanum, uh, to all these that you know Tim Kaine. Uh, projects. Uh, I saw the phrase "the real Fallout 3" a couple times, and I just wonder what what is your uh, take on this? Do you are you uh, do you like to see that sort? Of, are you happy about that these comparisons, or do you feel like people are missing uh, the point? Does it actually anger you? I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I don't mind it because uh, in the beginning we were kind of going for uh, uh, I I mean earlier when uh, we were just starting out, when I was just starting out, I kind of advertised it as sort of a Fallout Arcanum game because it was, it, was an, uh, it was the easiest way to describe it, you know. So someone who would pick up the game would have an idea what it is. So I don't mind uh, like people comparing it to the Fallout or thinking it's a, a spiritual successor to Fallout. And in some ways it is because we, we took a lot of... Uh, basic stuff from those games uh, and uh, built upon it. You know. uh, Fallout, uh, uh, people mostly compare it with Fallout, but uh, Unreal is a lot, of dif a lot different from Fallout in a lot of ways. You know, Fallout has uh, very simple combat. It has a good, but very simple combat with very, uh, very few elements, uh, very few uh, variables, everything, and uh, Unreal has a lot of elements to the combat, a lot of variables, a lot of tools. You, you know, in Fallout, you can like shoot people or uh, throw a grenade, and that's about it. You know, there, there's I don't know if there's anything else, but in our game, you can set traps, you can throw grenades, you can uh, throw psi abilities, you can do special attacks, and everything. We have a lot of lot, lot more elements going for, and that, that's not like. Uh, uh, saying that uh, one is better or the other is just uh, different in that sort. Uh, Fallout has a very, very simple, uh, very, very well, well thought of system, but it, it, I don't think it lends well uh, to the sort of uh, game uh, that Unreal is. Where you, uh, not even to the sort of game that the Fallout is, because you effectively control just one character. You know? And if you don't have a lot of options for that character, the, the combat can get boring. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, the sort of system the Fallout had is, is more 
it's better used for uh, squad based games where you have like positioning you know cover and that sort of thing and the, the, then you don't have to have a lot of different special attacks you you derive the gameplay from uh, uh, the squad tactics you know but when you have just one character then i think it's important to be able to distinguish all different play styles and have a lot of uh, tools at your disposal yeah, I think it's you've kind of spoiled me in terms of combat with Underreal. I mean, if, I was just thinking if I went back and played the original Fallout game now, I'd feel like it was so simplistic. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it's simplistic, but it's good. You know, it's it's good combat. But uh, uh, I didn't just want to you know copy the Fallout combat. I wanted to make something uh, uh, something more uh, more complex. Yeah. Here's kind of a related question from the Bear Paw. A kind of a fun name. I don't know what, what that's all about. But anyways, he uh, asked, what were the original elements of Fallout and other old-school RPGs that you uh, wanted to bring into Underreal? Uh, well, uh, the open world and uh, like the, the experience of, of uh, going through that open world, it's a hostile world, and finding a, a ways to, to navigate it and to, to defeat you know, enemies and uh, complete your objectives and everything in in that ho- in that world world and always having that that sort of uh uh like a uh, feeling of uh, being left on your own you know you don't have anyone uh that will assist you you're not part of some uh big organization of or anything i i noticed a lot of the uh, the new RPGs, you're always uh, some uh, hotshot, some, uh, someone important. You have your base, you have your minions, you know, your companions, right. and everyone is talking about you. And, everything. and in Fallout, it wasn't like that. You're just some guy that wanders into a town and uh, makes a mess, you know, and everyone wants to kill him or something. And that's sort of the feelings that, that, that I want to go with. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should have uh, at least one more, maybe two more episodes with uh, uh, Mr. Stitch. Lots of great stuff coming up, so please stay tuned if you enjoyed this. The best is yet to come. As always, I want to thank you, 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 thank you very much for your support of the show. It really means a lot to me, guys. You know, just in case, if you haven't stepped up to the plate already, you know, why don't you make it a New Year's resolution, if you will, to support your favorite YouTubers, the guys that do all the work to bring these shows to you, to interview people like Stidge, give you the behind-the-scenes information that you would otherwise miss out on. Uh, so anyway, if you've already supported the show, thank you. If you're thinking about it, uh, please go ahead and do it. It really mean a lot to me. So thank you, one and all. Now what about that news from the Mat Cave? Quite a bit of news here. Uh, Shane Stacks, he's always, you can always count on him for a story or two. He wrote in about this uh, unto- article about the untold story of the invention of the game cartridge. And if you're curious, that is not the Atari 2600, uh, but rather something called the Channel F Fairchild console, which not a lot of people know about. Uh, but this article goes into a lot of depth about it. it. Apparently they were inspired by the 8-track cartridges, if you know what those are. You might thought this was a great article. I wanted to pass it along. It's by Benji Edwards. Uh, so I'll post a link to that in the show notes, so check it out. A couple other items. Uh, there was an article on Polygon about this guy, a Japanese guy, that left his uh, Super Nintendo plugged in, powered on, for 20 years <laughs> just to keep his save game. Now, uh, apparently the game in question was uh, some Japanese-only thing, but I thought that was kind of cool. Apparently it was on for over 180,000 hours. You know, the, the least people will go to to uh, keep from having to redo their game, I guess. And then uh, Richard Moss over at Rock Paper Shotgun wrote a, a really cool article about the modding community of Age of Empires 2. Uh, so that game is still thriving, you know, even it's been 16 years, but uh, the article kind of goes into detail about this modding community, what drives them, and the sort of challenges they face. And I thought it was really cool, so I thought I would post a link to that too. All right, what about that ale of the week? I was going to show you this too, by the way. Uh, this is a one of my Christmas gifts this year, I don't know if you can see this, but one of my friends is a wood carver, and he carved out this uh, Mario for me. I just thought I'd show that. It's pretty cool. 
No, I <laughs> would that I had that kind of talent. All right, the ale of the week is, uh, oh, by the way, the guy's name is Chris Kochler. <laughs> I think he might do these, uh, he might be willing to make you one. I don't know what, you'd have to talk to him about pricing, but uh, if you're interested in something like that, let me know and I'll pass it on. Anyway, about this ale, we've got the New Belgian Blackberry Barley Wine Ale, and I'm a huge fan of barley wines. One of my favorites, right up there with the triples. Uh, this is a blackberry one, uh, so I'm kind of curious how that's going to work out. It's by the Lips of Faith series. It's uh, let's see. Alcohol 10% by volume, so definitely on the stronger side. Let's see. Smooth as the silk ascot you should be wearing while sipping this barley wine, brewed with fresh blackberries. A trip under your nose reveals aromas of toasted oak, caramel, toffee, and bur burgundy. Sip with purpose. Well, I don't have a silk ascot, but I do have a really awesome plague rat belt buckle from Australia. Hey, <laughs> uh, by courtesy of Alchemy. Uh, Unfortunately, it's the very last one in existence, so sorry guys, but uh, you know, what can I say? Okay, uh, New Belgian Brewing, Fort Collins, Colorado, ale brewed with black uh, blackberries. <laughs> anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this New Belgian Lips of Faith uh, blackberry barley wine. Like I can say, you can definitely smell the blackberries in this, a very fruity aroma. You know, it smells like a like a bowl of blackberries. Really, really nice aroma on this. Yeah, I don't know who could smell this and not not uh, not like it. So let's give it a taste, though. Well, those blackberries are really. Uh, it's almost like a spoonful of uh, blackberry jam on this. Uh, not a lot of an uh, alcoholic taste at all. Uh, just a really sweet. Uh, uh, blackberry. <laughs> I mean, the blackberries are really infused uh, really well into this. It's nice, creamy, got a really nice uh, texture on this. The aftertaste, very pleasant. Uh, <laughs> I think we've got a winner here. Yeah, just a fabulous uh, choice here. It's kind of like a champagne with blackberry. Uh, sort of uh, taste is what I'm getting from this. Uh, really, really good. No alcohol fumes, uh, no blowback. <laughs> you know, this is one you could uh, sip on very happily, I think. And uh, even somebody that doesn't like beer might like this one. The if you ever ever tried the uh, barley wines, they're quite a bit different than the other beers out there. So if you're one of those types that hates beer, try a barley wine and see what you think about that. Maybe let's start with this blackberry from uh, Lips of Faith series. Uh, New Belgium. Anyway, really, really good. I'm going to go full uh, five out of five drinking horns on this. A uh, very pleasant, uh, wonderful taste on this. Especially, well, <laughs> if you like blackberries, that is. If you hate blackberries, uh, you might want to go somewhere else. But otherwise, I think you will enjoy it. So, five out of five drinking horns on the uh, blackberry barley wine ale Lips of Faith series New Belgium. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, we talked a lot about language in that episode. Uh, so I was looking for quotes about language, and I came across one from uh, one of my favorite authors, J.R.R. Tolkien. It goes something like this. I wish life was not so short. Languages take such a time, and so do all the things one wants to know about. I'll see you guys next week.